Thank you for tuning in to Hacks and Hobbies with your host, Junaid. We're visited by our amazing guests coming from all walks of life. We want to learn their story, their struggles, and their journey on how they got to where they are today. So stick around. In this episode, I get to speak with Dr. AJ Minai. He's a two times TEDx speaker, a best LinkedIn influencer, brand storyteller, and one of the most inspirational LinkedIn icons in Malaysia. I connected with him through LinkedIn, and LinkedIn is really strong in that game where you get to connect with real people that have, you know, experienced the world and, you know, We've been chatting for the past uh, few minutes in the green room, and we've been connected for the past month, and we've been having really cool conversations. And then, you know, I just can't wait to bring him on to the episode. Thank you so much, Dr. AJ, for coming on. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you so much for having me, bro. It's a real privilege. Absolutely. I'm really happy. Yeah, man. Uh, the, the conversations we've been having in the green room, it's really eye-opening. It's really the kind of stuff that I love when I, you know, talk to is like when, when you have a human to human conversation and you just dig deep, like you're not focusing on the small talk anymore. You're just going really deep into our mental spaces. Like right. you come up with so much amazing stuff to talk about because, you know, we have a very short time on this earth and yeah. the best thing that we can do is, is uh, leave a legacy and, and sure, you know, some people are okay with the status quo, but I right. wasn't, and I know you weren't either. So here we are. Absolutely, here we are. Here we are. A bunch of uh, disrupted pirates <laughs> on, a, on a journey on the on, on the on the ocean that we call that we call life, right? And, That's right. Um, yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm really happy to be here, Jeanette. Thanks so much. I really love the the work that you do. Thank you. Um, and I know you've had some really prolific guests on the show before, so I hope I live up to uh, the expectations that Absolutely. the audience and, uh, and you have, bro. <laughs> um, Thank you. But uh, that being said, uh, I think I think it's really important for. I mean, people. I, I don't mean I don't mean to to put a bummer to, like a downer to what you know, what, what's starting out to be a really, really inspiring and positive conversation. Yeah. But I think there's something that you said to me in the green room earlier that really kind of, it brought a good, good point to my, to my attention. Most of the times when people get on to shows like this, right. When, when they get onto conversations like this, whether it's on LinkedIn or Facebook live or, yeah, or whatever you do, whichever platform, I noticed that most people try to leverage the hell out of it for their own branding. Right. Um, and, 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 you know, obviously it's a portrayal, to showcase to the world how awesome you are, yeah. um, you know, uh, both the host and the hostee. But uh, maybe you know what you brought up in the in the green room backstage really yeah. kind of kind of just uh, got me thinking. You know, like maybe you should talk about the mistakes, AJ. You know, that you made along the way. And yeah. I was thinking about that, and I was like, right, you know, because most people look at that that fifteen minutes of fame, and they go, like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to maximize my PR out of this, I'm gonna mm -hmm. maximize my branding, so. Whatever yeah. I say has to make me look like a rock star. Yeah. But maybe maybe that's maybe that's 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 not really what we should do on the show today. Maybe yeah. we should talk about, like you said, something was... a little bit more um, I wouldn't say morbid, but mm -hmm. a little bit more, you know, practical and a bit yeah. more real uh, for us to be able to sort of showcase to the viewers and the people who listen to this eventually in the future as well. Yeah. And possibly even you and me when we look back at this in the in the future. Exactly. We can learn uh, something from our former selves, our past selves, right? Yeah. Um, we always need we need reminders, right? Gentle reminders from time to time. We kind of forget Absolutely. life. Yeah. Human. So yeah, I'm thinking, why don't we go down that path, bro? So yeah, tell me, good. tell me more about how how do we take this forward? Sure. So so the first question I usually ask is, you know, tell us a version of your journey that no one's have heard of before, and we all have versions of our journey. That we say, you know, oh, I did this and I did this and then I that made, got me up here, but we kind of ignore the all the stuff that's under the iceberg. The one, you know, so there's the iceberg, right? So this is the status quo, but all the hard work, all those 
countless hours when, when you're like, oh my God, you, my content is not working. Oh my God, these people are going to say this. All that stuff and that, that's underneath, right? Nobody looks at that stuff. So sure. it's, it's important to highlight those things because as we have days, we also have nights. And that rhythm is necessary for the life for the time, you know, for time to pass, for life to be alive, we have ups and downs. Our heartbeat is a literal wave of ups and downs, right? So right. without that up and down, we can't continue life. So let's get into some of those mistakes. And I, I mentioned some of my mistakes that I made along the way, right? Um, right. So, and and what I learned from it is, you know, that it's super important to have a coach. It's super important to have somebody to go to that's either walk the path or that can help you along the way figure right. out, hey, this is what I'm figuring out and doing. And it's it's kind of getting me some good results. Why don't you try it? And then, you know, so there's all two heads is always better than one for sure. No doubt, no doubt, no doubt. Yeah. Absolutely. Well said, well said. Yeah. Um, uh, so this is a bit of a pickle for me and a bit of a dilemma, mm -hmm. man. Because sure. You, you, you said it. You got to say something that people, a version of you that people don't know. Now, the problem is I'm an open book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the problem, the problem is, is that I fairly, I fairly done a lot of content creation on LinkedIn, yeah. which I've told everybody all types of my own journey. Nice. I love it. And, 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 and unfortunately to top it all off, my second TEDx talk was titled from rough to ready. And it was completely based on my life, my life journey. So, <laughs> nice. We'll have to go so check it out. Nothing I can say that truly, <laughs> I, think, I can't say that that no one would not know anything. Sure, sure. Like that. I'm sure that I'm sure that some people would know, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I can I can say, I think there is one thing that probably I've not openly talked about that I can mm -hmm. probably leave on this show that I've sure. never said really to anybody else, at least on 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 LinkedIn. Yeah. Right. And um, that is for kids not to feel pressured by life. Right. And I think yeah. that's really important for me because if you if you really want to know AJ, you need to go back to who AJ was when he was a child. Yeah. And who he was as a kid. And you know what? It's really the same for all of us. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the formations that take place during our formative years actually shape and mold us a lot more than people think they, they, they think they do, right? They yeah. really, they really don't, we underestimate it. We think that, you know, there were, there were a couple of years in our early adulthood that all of a sudden molded us, molded us into the people we are. That's not true. Everything yeah. that's happened since the formative years of your life, Absolutely. when you were in school, all the way, high school, tertiary, your first job, all of that, all of it plays a huge role in the type of person you are standing in front of that other person in that yeah. moment. Yeah. Like right now, who I am in front of you, Janet, I think that's it's all that, that journey, that culmination is who I am now in front of you, yeah. right? And one thing that really, really breaks my heart, that really, really breaks my heart is particularly in, actually, I wouldn't even say Asian culture, I'd say this is a global dilemma is how education has failed us, right? Oh education has failed us yeah. in so many ways. Um, it's created a system in which parents and children, particularly when kids are getting older and they're heading towards high school and particularly in Asian, like I, I think, I think, not just in like Asian, but I, we zoom in, we talk about Desi communities. Yes. And then we've got communities that are Oriental communities, right? right? And I'm talking about, I'm talking about as a global citizen who's mixed and I've got all of these mixes in me, right? As far mm -hmm. as, I, and I can tell you right now, this is actually yeah. from firsthand experience. Like growing up as kids, I had cousins and friends and all that who were obsessed about getting into an Ivy League university, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but the problem was, and don't get me wrong, I've got nothing against Ivy League universities. No. But I do have a problem with the sort of ethos that we've created in education today that a child lives for. Yeah. They, they, live, they live to obsess over straight A's. They live to obsess over becoming something that they may not necessarily really want 
to be, but they're doing it because of community pressure or parental pressure or pressure from their friends, right? And Absolutely. like anybody who's from South Asian communities, anybody who's from Oriental communities, anybody who's even in North America right now, right? Yeah. Kid trying to get into Dartmouth or, or Columbia or Harvard, right? Mm -hmm. I remember growing up as a kid and being an exile and an outcast because yeah. I was one of those rare kids that just didn't see the value in going to an Ivy League university. I, I was like, all my other friends would be like, dude, I want to get into Harvard. Dude, I want to get into this and I want to do that. I had a friend of mine who wanted to do religious studies in Harvard. No offense, again, I mean, no offense, man. Maybe yeah. religious studies are great in Harvard, man. Yeah, I don't know. You know right? who knows, yeah. With all due respect, Harvard isn't probably the best institution to go for religious studies, bro. You know, I mean, it's my opinion. I mean, I think it, it, it feels more to me that just like social media we talked about earlier, yeah, education has become big business it in is, which yeah. people are playing the glamour game, right? And kids have this completely scored version of success before yeah. they hit the real world. It's, it's crazy. They, they, they have no idea what's, work, what's waiting for them when they hit the real world, when they hit the industry, before they meet people and start listening to people like Gary Vee, right? Yes. They, they live in their own bubble. They live in their yeah. own world. And if that bubble is, if I get into Harvard, if I get into Columbia, if I get into Oxford, if I get into Yale, then my life is set, you know? Uh, these straight A's and all this stuff that I do, this is my life. And if I do this right, then I will turn into an icon just like Steve Jobs just like Mark. So they think their academic success is what's mm -hmm. going to carry them right. all the way through to the top. But what they really don't understand is, irrespective if you go to Harvard or you go to Timbuktu, with all due respect, bro, yeah, it's what you do that makes you into the next Steve Jobs and the next exactly. Gary Vee. Exactly. It is not your, your CGPA. Yeah. It is not your, 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 the fact that you've got a law degree from Harvard Business School or an MBA or whatever you've got. You know what I mean? It, it, and I'm, again, don't get me wrong. I'm not downplaying the value of educational institutions no, education is important. That, have built, that have built such a huge reputation. And they're, they're doing some amazing things. Don't get me wrong. I'm a huge fan of these institutions because of a host of people there who are making lives better through their own research. Don't get me exactly. wrong. I'm not, saying, I'm not slandering an Ivy League university. No, 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 no. All no, I'm no, saying no. Is, 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 the, is the mentality and the, assembly line, the mm -hmm. assembly line mindset that we've created around the world because yeah. education has failed us because as a concept, education was meant to empower the individual to find who they are exactly. truly within themselves. Yeah. But even when I was in grade eight, man, I remember I asked one of my teachers, I still remember this, she was my geography teacher. Mm -hmm. I wasn't in grade eight, sorry, not grade eight. I was in grade seven, I think, mm -hmm. grade seven or grade six. And I said to her, I remember her name, Mrs. Hall. She was my geography or my history. She was my history teacher. And I asked Ms. Hall, I was like, Ms. Hall, why is my timetable the same as Tim's timetable? There was another kid called Timothy. And I, I was like, I was like, why is Timothy's timetable the same as mine? And why is mine? And then she looked at me really funny. And she looked at me and she's like, what type of question is that? And I said, well, it just, it just occurs to me that I might be good at things that Tim isn't. And Tim might be good at things that I'm not. Don't you think that we should have timetables that would build us as individuals, you know, mm -hmm. follow through my, my, my passion? And she laughed at me and she goes, well, school doesn't operate on your wishes, young man. It operates on a foundation that is uh, effective and valuable for all. And, and, you know, when I was a kid, that sounded like a very smart answer that Mrs. Mm -hmm. Hall gave me. But actually now, as an adult, I think back, and with all due respect, Mrs. Hall was full of shit, right? <laughs> um, I'm sorry, Mrs. Hall. I mean, you know, you know, I love you. If you ever watch this, don't get angry at me. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, that was so full of shit because, yeah. you know, school is not meant to be a place to homogenize people. It's not a place where you make everything the same. It yeah. is a place where you allow people to be different. And that is why bullying took place. Bullying happened in schools because school was so obsessed with everybody fitting into a bloody box mm -hmm. the same way. But the problem is when you've got a class of kids, this kid is a fish, that kid is a bear, that kid is a stork, 
there's so many different other, there's there all sorts of different animal spirits in that class. Exactly. And all of a sudden, you build an entire curriculum around digging in the ground. So the bear does amazingly well. The vast majority of bears get straight A's, but the stork and the fish, they end up as retards mm -hmm. by your standards because you say, wow, this kid's dumb because they can't be intelligent the way I want them to be. Right. Right. And that's not, that's not intelligence. Intelligence yeah. isn't the way I want you to be intelligence. Intelligence is something limitless. It's the uniqueness that you have within you. And there are different types of intelligence. Science has proven it now. Yeah. You've got everything from EQ to SQ to CQ. Man, there's so many Qs. I've lost count, bro. Yeah. You know? It's amazing. And that's my point. There's one thing I would go back and change, bro. One big mistake that I made. I spent a lot of time worrying about things mm. that I didn't have to worry about, man. Like, I didn't have to worry about them. I really wish parents out there listening, stop, stop stressing your kids out, man, mm -hmm. with tuitions that run into, like, 11 o'clock in the night. Yeah. Stop killing them about making sure they get into Harvard and Oxford. Don't get me wrong. You can have a conversation. You can have a, have a goal towards getting into an Ivy League. There's nothing wrong with that. But make sure you're going to those places for the right reasons, not because you want to prove something to your community yeah. about what people would say. This is a huge problem, particularly in Asian communities. We have this huge thing about what people would say. What would people say? What would, what would your uncle say? What would he say? I don't give a shit what they say, bro. I mean, seriously. I mean, all yeah. due respect, it's, live it's, your own life. It's, it's, yeah, exactly. You know, live your own buddy life, man. Don't, don't, don't live your life for someone else. And I say that even to kids now that I coach. I mean, I know I shouldn't say it, but mm -hmm. I tell them, listen to your parents. You know, learn from everyone. But at the end of the day, don't follow anyone. Yeah. Follow yourself. Follow what's inside of you, man. Because yeah. life is too short. You said it earlier, bro. Life is too short yeah. to live your life for your father, for your mother, for your grandfather, for your uncle, for your girlfriend, for your yeah. wife. Live your own life for yourself. Live it so that you're proud of the legacy that you build, right? Exactly. And have the freedom to do it, right? Yeah. And, and that's, that's a huge that's something. Thing no, absolutely. And, and that's something that Gary Vee says too, right? He's like, sure. You know, if you're, if you're taking on the entrepreneurship journey, if you're learning and you're implying these these things and you are adamant and you are working super hard, if it's gonna make your parents unhappy, let that be because it's just gonna be for a little bit. As yeah. soon as they start seeing you successful, they'll be all they they'll be on your chill, you know, they'll be on your side. Yeah, they're your leaders. They're your right? biggest fan. Biggest right. fans. Uh, and uh, I was so being at, at this new position. Uh, I have act. I I was told about this access to Flickr's World Bank library of photos. There's over twelve thousand photos, yeah, and they're from all over the world. So I'm going through this library and I see so many photos of children, and I was like, "This is amazing!" Like children from all over the world, they look the same. They all need the same things. So I was like, you know what? This could be a really cool post about children and. And so I, I started looking up some quotes and like, and then found found some cool ones. Like Margaret Mead says he, she's a yeah. cultural anthropologist. Yeah. Children must be taught how to think, not what to think. Exactly. And that's what's been happening in schools. They're teaching. They're being taught what to think, not exactly. how to think. So true. So true. Margaret Mead is a legend. I love her. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, it's, it's you're absolutely so right, amazing. man. Yeah. That's that's yeah. like that's like the probably the first thing that I can, I've ever shared on, this is like probably one thing that I've shared on, I've, I've talked about this briefly in my first TEDx talk, mm -hmm. educate for life, not for work. Yeah. But on a show like this, I've never talked about it in context to, to education and myself. Yeah. Right? I made the same mistake that I talk about during my first TEDx talk that I, I, I wasn't educating myself for, for life. I was educating myself for work. Yeah. And that's really what people are doing. I mean, parents and kids alike are making this mistake thinking, that once I get my that four year degree program, once I get a paper, yeah, then my life is going to change. Right, it's going to turn. It's just going to go one eighty. Go upside like, down. No. No. <laughs> once I do it, like once I'm done, that's it. College has made me into a success. No, it doesn't. No, it I doesn't. mean, to be honest, the tip of the iceberg is not even the tip. I, I can't even call it the tip of the iceberg. No, it's it not. It's right? it's just a handbook. You have to it, apply those things yeah. like that you learned in school in real life to be able to be successful, right? Absolutely. Um, um, 
because there's so many people that are just coming out of college that don't have jobs. Yeah. Because and you no surprise why, bro. Because they've gone through a system of, of, of an assembly line where they've come out quite frankly like robots, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um and they just don't they just don't they it's not even their fault. They they no, haven't been given the opportunity to be exposed to just one good teacher. I've seen yeah. the power of just one good teacher if you're oh lucky. My God. Oh my you know? God. One good teacher in an entire system that is broken can change a child's life. Yeah. Can change someone's life. I've seen that my I've 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 witnessed it because I've had teachers like I was blessed enough to have teachers to make me understand that life is not about fitting in, it's about standing out. Yeah. And if I did not have those teachers with me, I would have been lost. I probably would not have become AJ Minai the way I am today. Right. right. So the other thing that I would like to share with the viewers after the first point around education and kids not worrying as much as they and killing themselves as much as they do and society in general, the next point in terms of the mistakes that I made was probably around this issue where I felt like resonate, I resonate so strongly with what you just mentioned about a coach, a mentor, or a teacher. Mm -hmm. You know, learn how to seek out someone that you connect with. Not, you don't hire them. It's not like a tuition teacher. I'm not talking about a tuition teacher, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's pretty easy to, to open up, you know, to hit up on Google and find yourself a maths teacher in your proximity and get hired for, you know, hire that guy for, for maths tuition. Yeah. Now, I'm not talking about tuition. I'm not talking about college. I'm talking about, I see a future where kids and adults alike will all start to go to life coaches, right? People who will get them more industry relevant and more industry ready because yeah. of the damage that education is doing to them. I see them, I see younger kids going to counseling and mentorships like this more, more, more prevalently, yeah. more dominantly, right? Right now, I think it's always just a, a, a aspect of, a, of an ulterior motive. I see kids going to, to mentors to get something out of it. For example, yeah. if I go and if I spend a semester with this guy as his research assistant, I'm definitely going to get credit and that'll get me into Harvard. Again, yeah. it's, a, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a game where you're playing just to appease you know, your CV, again, right. you're falling into that same trap, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm talking about the way you said it earlier, bro. The way where everyone needs to find a true Jedi counsel, yeah. right? And, and kids, kids can find that person in their parents if they're fortunate enough. Yeah. But unfortunately, the reality is, is that many kids are not that fortunate enough. Yeah. I, and again, I'm not being an ass here. But I'm gonna be really honest. But not everyone's parents can truly coach their kids. No, they can boss them around. They can, yeah. They can tell them what to do. They can do exactly what Margaret Mead said they could do. Tell them what to think. But can they truly coach them in a way that the child can accept it? Yeah. I I would actually honestly go far enough to venture and say, in about seventy to eighty percent of the times, no. No. They yeah. can't coach the kid. Not the way a stranger can. That's why right. it's really important that you need to have a Jedi Council. Mm -hmm. As parents, you know, people need to be a bit more open about letting their children have healthy other personalities in their life to get yeah. feedback, right? Not just obsessively into a nuclear family where mom and dad are the king and queen and that's it. What they say goes sort of thing, you know? Yeah. I think this is the time. If you want to create more Gary V's, you want to create more Steve Jobs, then you need to allow that, that flourishing, you yeah. know, even in a household when a child is about 12, 13 years old. I think with the internet and social media, that's already started. Kids YouTube and learn literally half the stuff they know everything. on YouTube now. You everything, know? yeah. So everything, right? So, but at the same time, with the internet and with social media, there are some other dark sides that we talked about earlier, right? You and I. And... Mm. Uh, that's probably something else that I want to talk about as a, as a big problem that I did. Like one of the yeah. things that I, the beginning of my own LinkedIn career yeah. and my own LinkedIn tenure was based in this, in this fakeness. Right. And uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but yeah. the second point, just to reiterate the mistake that I made was that I didn't raise my hand early enough in life to say, to shout out and say, listen, I think I need help. 
I need help in these areas in my life. Absolutely. And I wasn't brave enough to accept yeah. that maybe the people around me, my loved ones, yeah. were not qualified to give me the advice. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's a, it's a societal issue where is, we're yeah. programmed to believe that our loved ones have all the answers. But I think as we grow older, we start to realize that it's okay. It's okay to get some answers from your loved ones. Yeah. Some answers from not people that you love. You know what I mean? Absolutely, you know I mean? man. It's hitting so many points in my head because so when I move when I moved from the from Saudi Arabia to the States, right? I finished right. my um, intermediate and finished my FSC through Pakistan Embassy School. And then I came here and everybody said, you know, you got to go to the community college. Nobody said you got to go to a four-year college. Like nobody, right? right? So I did not have great mentors because, um, you know, my uncles, they didn't finish college. One of them did, but, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't living with him. But then they're like, you know, you got to go to college or you got to go to community college. And then you can right. go to a four-year college. Right. And then I ended up going to community college for six years. And I never finished my degree. Like, I never got a degree. So anytime I'm talking to a recruiter, they're like, okay, you have this, you know, do you have any degree, sir? I'm like, no, I don't. You know? Right. And, like, probably 15 years ago, I had uh, paid some company in Netherlands to get a fake degree. <laughs> it's like, wow. something down, right? But then... That screwed me up for one of the jobs. So I was like, all right, I'm not doing this anymore. Just stated the right. truth. You know, I, I have a ton of experience. I can talk about that all day long. But no, I don't have a degree. I've taken certificates. That was very brave of you, man. Right. I so, courage. Thank you. That's thank brilliant. You. That's brilliant. Because again, right, it's it's not about having that piece of paper. It's having the actual working experience that's gonna get you the solutions that you're trying to solve. And then right. as, you're, as you're mentioning about, you know, the different mistakes and all the parents having the ability to coach their children to, you know, think how to think or, you know, teach them how to think, not what to think. So, like, just today I, would, I was having a conversa conversation with my four-year-old, almost five-year-old, and I'm telling him, you know, can you go wake up your brother? And he's like, I right. can't. You know, can right. you go change your clothes? And he's like, I can't. I'm like, yes, you can. You know, you got to get rid, get rid of that can't word out of your mind because let's think about things. So I'm, I'm, I'm giving examples of, you know, how do you think this entire house was built? Did people right. just say, no, I can't. No, you build a little bit at a time. And I was like, you, you've done some amazing things with the Lego pieces that you have. You've built, you know, all of these things. And so I'm counting all these things on his fingers that he's done himself. And then that in, in, invoked him to, you know, add to that list, oh, I've done this, oh, I've done this, so opening up his mind, like, hey, you can do anything. And right. if you can't do certain things, it's because, you know, either you can't reach it, ask for that specific help, you know, ask, hey, I can't get my pants from up in the closet because it's way up high, so can you help me with that specific thing? So when you're right. more specific and you, you help, you know, trying to get that little point that gets in their heads and, you know, hope they stick, but then again, yeah. you've got to keep at it and, you know, in like the them. Absolutely. And I, I, completely, I completely see where that is because, I mean, I, I can see how technology and this world of social media and digital disruption has changed almost the DNA of our younger generation. Yeah. Because, you know, if, if, if you talk about how I was as a kid when I was when, – when you and I were kids – we we would we would look out a window a, a glass window and our focus would be on what's outside of that window mm -hmm. we would automatically look at what's outside that window but you know what kids do now if they see a glass window they take their finger and they do this to try to swipe it up <laughs> they try to they try to they try to do this and i've actually seen that mm -hmm. i saw my own nephew uh who's actually about nearly 18, 19 now, but oh. I saw him several years ago standing in front of a window and he was doing this on it. He was doing that on it, you know, and you know, that goes to show you how much the psyche and the, the generations have changed that yeah. when a child today that's born into the world today, they cannot imagine a world without a mobile phone. They cannot yeah. imagine a world it's without insane. a truly connected internet, right? Mm -hmm. They cannot imagine a world 
where they look at a screen and it doesn't interact back with them. It's like, well, it's you don't have screen. Wi-Fi? Like, no, yeah, there's no Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi you know and, and you know what? It's not even them. It's us as well now. It is. You know, like, I mean, you know, you, we're all guilty too. It's not mm-hmm. like we, we can blame them. We're, we're just as guilty. We're, they see what it's they our responsibility in fact we're more responsible than they are you know why yeah. because we know what the world was before mm-hmm. you can't blame them they never saw it we they saw it so we have to stand up and tell them listen man the world is a lot more than you making friends on instagram and becoming yeah. an instant baby or becoming an influencer on linkedin mm-hmm. the world is a lot more than that you know yeah. it's enriched human relationships and what you do offline equally that counts Right? Don't get me wrong. Personal branding is really important. important Every yeah. child needs to learn how personal branding plays a huge role. Every company in the future is going to be a media company and every individual is a brand. Right? Yeah. I really believe that. So Absolutely. don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. As long as you do it the right way, however, the disclaimer is as long as you do it for the right, you do it the right way and you do it for the right reasons. Yes. It's, right now, it's being done for all the wrong reasons, particularly yeah, by, by standards of Instagram and on LinkedIn even now. Mm-hmm. You see a lot of people who have hundreds of thousands of followers, right? They, they talk a huge game, but with all due respect, they live just above the poverty line, mm-hmm. right? I mean, I, you know, I know personally that yeah. they aren't doing very well. And again, I'm not saying that I'm measuring them by financial success. I'm not. Right. That's fine. I'm not. I'm not even, people, people have different versions of success, right? People may feel that financial wealth is one indicator of success. Someone else might feel happiness. And living, you know, frugally is another indicator of success. So yeah. I'm not talking about the financial aspects of demeaning that person. What I'm talking about is the hypocritical aspect of that personality. Yeah. That person is going online and creating that portrayal of a life that is lush, luxurious. Mm-hmm. But in reality, they are suffering to pay their bills, right? Absolutely. Why are you, why are you trying to put on that show? Why? Why don't you just be real and be vulnerable, right? Yeah. Now, yeah. man, I, I, I'll, I'll take an example of a post that I did today. So I've got, I've got this platform coming up and this up and coming platform that's really growing around the world called mm-hmm. Tin, mm-hmm. right? And, uh, and I, met the, I met the guy a couple of weeks ago who came over and said, I saw your TEDx talks and I really want you to talk at, at the Tin platform. And it's happening. It's growing really fast. I mean, in the last couple of months, it's grown in five cities. Apparently, by the next year, they're going to have even more chapters around the world. Wow. So they want to come up with their own platform. And it's a global movement for, for good, right? And um, during, that, during the post today, I was asking myself while I was writing the post about announcing my involvement. I was writing about it. I was like, what is the, most, what is the biggest thing I'm excited about yeah. about this, this event? And I realized something. I realized that I'm more excited about the other two guys and their talks. Than I am about, about myself. Yeah. Right? And with all due respect, I'm 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 not discrediting myself, but I'm just being honest. I'm actually more excited to hear the talks that come out of the two other gentlemen who are there that night than myself. Right. Now, now from all brand personal branding best practices, mm-hmm. this goes against what people would tell you to do. That's insane. But I still did it yeah. because I felt that it was the real thing to do. It was the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. I should tell people how I feel. Yeah. And that's what I wrote in my post. I said, I got to be honest, but I'm not as excited about my own talk as I am about these two other guys. And then I did a shout out to each of them, mm-hmm. right, on my post. And I said, look, I, I, I like these guys because they're epic. They're really dope. They're doing some great stuff for the countries that they represent. And I would love to learn from them. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. I could have spun that around and made this all about a PR and a mileage sort of a branding thing about me being on yeah. stage with these guys and look how awesome I am. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, but I chose not to do that, and that's what I'm talking about. The younger generation, particularly, it needs our help in being able to to guide themselves to understand that it isn't about how many awesome people you know or how yeah. many epic people you can stand with on stage. With all due respect, it isn't about how many Gary Vees or Simon Sinek or or all these fellows that you really know. Yeah, it's about whether or not you are real enough to sit down with nobody's exactly is it are you can you get over yourself that's really right. what it is can that's, you get over that's... yourself and understand that despite your success in life whether it's financial whether it's fame whether it's pr whatever it is understand that it's all relative 
and that humility is permanent. Yes. Right. If, if you are, if you understand that, then you will continue to grow and you will probably continue to get more and more uh, known as well yeah. because of your humility, because, because you're real, humility. because you're real. That is why Gary grows. If yes. you think about it, people ask me all the time, why does, what do you think is so special about Gary? I was like, I'll tell you what's so special about Gary. Gary's real and he just says what he means. Mm-hmm. He doesn't sugarcoat it. He doesn't try to be someone else. Yeah. He is who he is. That's who he is, right? Exactly. People, people ask me, AJ, why are you always in a suit? Why do I always see you in a shirt and a tie? Why do I see you in a suit, man? What's your problem? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, dude, I, you know, you're going to laugh about this, but I used to sleep in pajama suits, man. Mm-hmm. Like, that's just me. I, yeah. That's who I am. This is that's who right. I am, really. Yeah. It's not like I only put it on for shows. Yeah. And I just put it on as a pretext. No, I really mm-hmm. wear suits all the time. I yeah. enjoy suits. It's a part of me. I enjoy them. Exactly. So you know what? With all due respect, I don't really care about what anybody else thinks. Right? No, you shouldn't. Uh, you Tony shouldn't Robbins, have to. Yeah, Tony Robbins didn't care about it in the beginning. I mean, Tony's become a lot more uh, casual about his dressing now. Uh, you know, he doesn't wear suits that often now. But if you oh, remember back in the 90s when Tony he, first started out, Tony Robbins, he's always been a suit, man. You know what I mean? He, he can't oh. wear him anymore, those suits, because he, he works out yeah. while he's on stage. I and mean, he'd be sweating like the whole state, right? He cannot wear, be wearing three, four layers of clothing. I know, right? He's jumping around. It's like he, <laughs> he with that passion, it's, it's so, so eclectic. I, I love it. <laughs> I know. It, it is. It's, it's infectious, right? And I was talking to somebody the other day here in Singapore who's based here, who went to his program. Yeah. And he said that Tony is special because this man can maintain the same level of energy for oh 10 hours God. straight. God. Oh my God, are you right? Straight. 10 hours straight. I got to tell you right now, as a motivational speaker and a coach and a trainer myself, yeah. who, when I was 21 years old, got into the game because of this man, because I was inspired by Tony. Tony. I can tell you right now that even after an hour, if you put in your 110%, even after an hour, an yeah. average person in the audience can tell that your energy levels are dropping. Yeah. Can you imagine the mastery that Tony has achieved in his life for him to be able to be on a stage for 10 hours straight. I know. He doesn't get off once. He doesn't get off once. On there. He takes no breaks. 10 hours straight. The man talks to you with the same level of energy as if he just came up on stage. Yeah. That is what makes Tony so special. Energy. That's true. It's, it's energy. He is. Right? And it, it's, it's actually what's amazing about it. It's, he he actually talks about some of these things in his uh, power talks or you know some of his interviews it's like the reason he's able to do it is because initially sure you know he's he's to be he probably didn't do it as much but then as you do it more and more you build that stamina it's yeah. like he's a he's a um concert performer yeah right yeah cuz essentially it is it's like a 10 hour concert that you're at yeah. because every 30 minutes you're out of your seat jumping and waving and clapping, you know, the person yeah. next to you. It's, and, 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 it's infectious, right? I mean, yeah. I, I just commented earlier on someone's post. I can't remember whose post it was on LinkedIn today. He talked about, you know, how uh, emotions are so important. I think it was a, a friend of mine here in, in Malaysia. And I taught, and I said that on his post, I said, you know what? Emotion creates motion and motion creates emotion, you know? If you're if you're slouching, if you're slouching and sitting down like this on a yeah. seat, yeah, you know, your tone will be affected, right? And if you know if you're you're speaking on the phone to someone and you're sitting down crouched or you're standing up and smiling, somehow the other person on the other side of the phone will know. You can feel it. You can feel mm-hmm. it. You see what I mean? Yeah. So emotion does create emotion, and similarly, emotion creates motion. Yeah. If you're in a state of mind where you are constantly, perpetually in the zone, as per Tony's rhetoric. You're mm-hmm. in that zone where you're in peak performance at all times. State of that mind where you're yeah. manifesting things all the time in your mind of success and growth in your life, right? Then your emotional state of being also will be lifted, right? You Absolutely. will be elevated, right? Your emotional health will be affected by that. So yeah. I, think, I think the so-called soft skills that people talk about in life are the hardest to learn. That's oh why God. I really, I tell people that all the time. And that's something that I, that's my, 
that's my third point uh, to share with the audience today. The biggest mistake that I made in my life was not not getting onto this realization quicker, where I should have realized that sales or business development wasn't my true calling in life. Mm -hmm. What my true calling in life was life skills, right? To to show people that if you are able to sharpen your self awareness, exactly what Gary Vee talks about. Yeah. If you are able to be self aware, then a lot of things in your life become so much more clearer and a lot more simpler. Yeah. Right. Um, and I think I have a regret in my life mm -hmm. that I didn't, I underestimated the value of this information and this knowledge that was in me since I was, you know, bullied as a kid. Mm -hmm. Because when I was bullied, bro, yeah. you see, well, the other kids, you see, okay, from nine to 16 years old, I was savagely bullied. Mm -hmm. Right. And I was an outcast. Nobody really liked me in school. Yeah. You know, and because I was picked on by the older kids, I was a small, scrawny, skinny kid who used to stammer most of the time, right? Mm. And because I was picked on by the other kids, what would I do? See, other kids were distracted all the time. Yeah. They were distracted by three things in life. One, IQ. Two, popularity. Three, just their day-to-day -day life in terms of coming coming, and going to school yeah. and living their life, right? Just to, That's just life, right? So yeah. IQ... Because they were good students and they were getting good grades, they were falling deeper and deeper into the system of straight A obsessions, Harvard and all that stuff, right? Yeah. Two, popularity. Kids were kids were who were who had their growth spurt earlier, especially the boys, yeah. right? They were they were they were more well built, muscular, they were jocks, they were all mm -hmm. this stuff going on. The girls used to love them, you know? They were a lot more popular than I was. Yeah. So they have they were a lot more distracted than me because they had a lot of stuff going on outside of them to keep them distracted, right? Yeah. And three, living their life because they just because they thought they were the shit, right? And they were like they were it. They they generally just lived their life without actually ever spending too much of time Thinking with their insights. It. Yeah. As a kid at that age, you hardly forget about. I mean, even adults today have have a hard time. Oh my god! Yeah. What we're talking about forget about kids. Kids can't mm -hmm. even understand it. So, with all these three reasons. I was the exact opposite. I, 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 I wasn't a very good student. So mm. I ended up not doing very well in my studies. So my IQ was kind of like a, well, you know, I never had an awesomely high IQ. Sure. Right. So kill that one. That's gone. What else do I have? Popularity. I was bullied. Right. So kill that one. That's gone. I had no popularity. And my life, what life would I have if, if school for me is torture? Yeah. How often do you think I would enjoy myself going to school, no. right? No, I used to hate it. And so I had no life. I had no distractions. Mm -hmm. At that time, I felt like I wanted to kill myself, bro. Mm -hmm. But now, once I got older, actually, just not, 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 not actually now, but once I got older, I realized yeah. something. Man. That was such a blessing in disguise. It was such a blessing in disguise because during that time, I used to run away from people when I was in break time at lunch and I used to go and spend time alone. I would mm -hmm. hide in places that people wouldn't find me. You know, I would do crazy stuff just to not feel the pain of being bullied. Right. And because of that, I got to observe people. I got to spend more time with myself. And while during those years where all these kids were having parties, they were being cool, they were dating, they were going through all that stuff. I was just this kid who was on his own processing all that information happening in front of me. Yeah. And so what was, what was the divine doing? The divine was uh, giving me the ability to build my soft skills a mm -hmm. lot faster than these kids who were getting straight. Cause you now, you now know yourself better, better. Absolutely. And, and you, you know, the then... really funny thing, bro, mm -hmm. you know, the really, really funny thing, dudes who bullied me now get coached by me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because they didn't build that self. You know, they, the self they, they have it. And, and again, yeah. it's not it's not an offense to them. I'm not no. I'm not downplaying them. Yeah. You know? Because I had a chance. I had a chance, bro. When I was about 16, the reason why I said nine to sixteen is because when I was about sixteen, I had my growth spurt. Mm. And then all of a sudden I got taller, bigger, more muscular, my yeah. voice. All of a sudden things changed for me. Yeah. And I had a choice in front of me, bro. I had that one choice. I could either be a Jedi or could be a Sith. Mm. Which one wanna be? Because now all of a sudden I have the force with me, right? Yes. I can extract my power on these people because the same guys who looked really scary to me 
all of a sudden like Space Jam yeah. looked kind of tiny to me. And I'm like, wait a second. I could I could do anything I want to you now and you yeah. can't even do anything you can't touch me so exactly. you know and and of course then all of a sudden they were like hey listen man I'm sorry you know before it was a different thing I'm so sorry you know they're all apologizing but I had a choice as a younger man mm. at that time to really understand do I want to be a Jedi do I want do I want to empower other people and protect people that went through what I did yeah. or do I want to be a Sith that want to use this power for my own self my own vengeance yeah. to help the to hurt these people to make them feel the pain I did and I'm really, really thankful. The nine to 16 year old period that I went through with my emotional intelligence being built and short circuited, mm -hmm. what happened was it all led up to that one choice, this Jedi and Sith choice. And if I had not gone through that pain, I would have picked the wrong path. Yeah. But because I went through that pain, I picked the right path. Mm -hmm. and I chose to be Jedi at that point. Yeah. And so I went on to look for other people who were being bullied in school and protect and help them instead of going after the guys who bullied me and spending my life building anger, hate, and resentment against yeah. me. Yeah. See what I mean? So that's amazing. That's, 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 really that's pretty powerful. much me, bro. Sorry for the rant, man. Forgive no, me. dude, that was, that was really, really powerful. And then, you know, you've answered a lot of questions that I've had in my mind about, you know, why this and why that and, and how, you know, the lessons that you learn. And it's, it's really, really powerful because, it's those decisions that we make in our life and and what you know the outcome and the outcome is obviously relevant right it's it's um not relevant but it's it's um it's obvious because you yeah. see what happened and you know when you when you mentioned you know between 9 and 16 you were being bullied and you were you know self you know you just focused on the self and I keep thinking about, you know, um, does that affect or does that also interfere based on who you are as a personality in that period of time versus who you are as a person in the later time of your life? Because uh, just the other day I was taking, I was my, you know, my siblings were like, oh, have you taken a 16 personality test? I'm like, oh, yeah. you have to take that before, right? So and I remember taking it like 20 years ago and I was like an iron, like I was an introvert and like, right and i'm an entp and now i am i am an enf something yeah enfj or something i can't remember yeah. but i used to be an introvert but thanks to gary v thanks to you know opening my mind through gary v and other not gary v, tony robbins because when i was introduced to tony robbins i was um i was traveling uh, for work and it was like 1 a.m in the midnight i was watching this infomercial i'm like oh my god who is this guy let me order these cds so i like immediately got on the phone ordered these cds <laughs> i was just totally blown away and, and he opened up my mind and, and um changed my mindset essentially because right. when that when you have that mindset shift that's when you really have that opportunity to look in on the inside look at who the person is what why are you here like what's the reason for you being here you know how can yeah. you make people's life better so that, that was really, really beautiful. I love it. Yeah, absolutely, man. And um, I, I think, I think to, to sort of wrap up all those three points and to recap yeah. what, what we talked about today is one is how education needs to be more for life and less for work in the, in the child, in a, in a mind of a child yeah. and in the mind of parents. And uh, two is really around how people need to start really allowing themselves to be who they really are earlier on in life yeah. and not be afraid, not try to fit in, you know, into the school system and just really just be themselves. Exactly. And uh, three is of course, being able to, to really understand that the so-called soft skills that come into play much later on in people's lives and, and somehow parents and kids and, and all these people, they think about these things later on in the later part of their lives should should be actually brought forward yeah you know the, the, yeah. the so-called functional skills uh to become a doctor and a lawyer and an engineer uh quite frankly no offense to any of those professions but you know going through a degree skills. program will get you that you can get you can become a doctor i if i want i can become a doctor today if i want to go and I enroll myself in medical school right now mm -hmm. I put in the effort i get the textbooks i can turn into a doctor in the yeah. next 10 years if i want yeah. to yeah but there are people who live their entire life 
not truly being awake to the fact that it isn't your IQ that really builds your success in life. It's your EQ, right? right? It's your ability to connect with people. It's your ability to empower others and inspire exactly. others. And yeah. more importantly, it's your ability to keep going, right? It's your ability to keep going despite what life throws at you. Yeah. And that doesn't come from your IQ. It comes yeah. from your EQ, right? Exactly. Um, and parents have forgotten the value of emotional intelligence in many ways yeah. because they're so busy getting their kids ready for a career. They're not busy getting their kids ready for life, right? And that's really what, so really what, what matters. And that's, if there's anything that I want to leave behind as a legacy is make sure that I build, I build part of the world or a world that allows kids and allows young adults mm -hmm. and even adults themselves to be able to explore who they really are as entrepreneurs, yeah, as, 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 as anybody as they want to be without fear of judgment yeah. from society, from, from educational institutes, from accreditation bodies. Yeah. You know, with all due respect, screw these people, man, because mm -hmm. they've made the world a smaller place. Oh yeah. They made it into a claustrophobic place. Yeah. They made it into a world where people worry about things where they shouldn't have to worry about them. Right? Exactly. If you want people to be creative, you want people to be who they truly are, you need to stop letting AJs happen the way they happen between nine to sixteen for me. Mm -hmm. You need to create places that are sanctuaries for kids yeah. of different types of kids. Absolutely. And every kid can be who they want to be, you know? Yeah. And the workplace has to empower employees yeah. the same way now. Absolutely. Because, you know, it, it's time that Gen X stops looking at Gen Y going, wow, what a bunch of entitled assholes. Mm -hmm. It's time that Gen Y stop looking at Gen X and baby boomers going, wow, these guys are old. Why don't they just die? You know yeah. what I mean? And yeah. it's time that the Gen Z understand that there's nothing they can do to change the reality mm -hmm. that they have to learn how to work with Ys, Xs, and boomers. Yeah. There are going to be four generations in the workplace, whether you like it or not. Well, yeah, right? exactly. There's going to be the chairman who is going to be over 65 to 70 years old mm -hmm. sitting on the chairman board, right? There's going to be the CEO who's about 45, right? Yeah. There's going to be the Ys who are the C minus one and C minus two VPs mm -hmm. type guy. And they're going to be the workforce themselves, the operational staff that are going to be the Zs, right? Who are coming out of college. The oldest Z is about 24 years old right now. Yeah. But here's the thing, bro. Why are we even calling them by and these letters? Right. Shouldn't why do we be. even call them these things? I mean, that's my point. My point yeah. is, why do we compartmentalize again? Like everything else that's, that we're talking about that's wrong with it. Why are we trying to compartmentalize a, a, a generation by a letter to, to sort of deem what the characteristics are of those people? Exactly. Right? Yeah. Like seeing AJ and thinking, oh, AJ is a Y. Yeah. He's probably good at tech. You know, probably a really startup -y guy type of guy, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, all these sort of conceptions, the same way you look at somebody older yeah. who's a, a boomer and go, oh, this guy probably doesn't even know how to text. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Yeah. Right. But, but none of it's true because no. you've got chairmen out there who are more active on LinkedIn than the so-called digital natives. Exactly. You go to a college today and I've, I've had this situation before, Janet. I've actually yeah. told kids, Hey, raise your hand. How many, how many people are on Instagram? And everybody in the class puts their hand up. They put yeah. up two hands, right? <laughs> and then I say, how many of you on Facebook? And then maybe half of them put it up because Facebook is apparently passe for the oh, younger yeah. generation. Mm -hmm. right? And then I say, hey, how many of you are on LinkedIn? Disclaimer, these are third year students. One more year before they hit the market, okay? Yeah. yeah. How many of you are on LinkedIn? Three people put up their hands. Out of the three people, how many of you are active on LinkedIn? Two people just knock out. One person keeps their hand up. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me the concept of active? Like, tell me how you define active. Yeah. I reshare articles that I read, bro. So then even that one last one gets knocked out. Yeah. So basically, Nobody's I turn around, I tell the class, let me get this straight, guys. You are a year away from the job market. And what you've done is you've spent hours of your day Instagramming shit. Facebooking shit, but you have no idea that you are missing out the biggest opportunity to make yourself stand out in a very noisy landscape by mm -hmm. using a platform like LinkedIn. Yeah. You know? And the first thing they go and tell me is, AJ, isn't LinkedIn for old people? And I'm like, 
you're old. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, now. yeah, I'm like, I'm old, right? But, but, but. No, not, not you being old. I'm saying the kids coming yeah, out of the college, kids, they're old now. They're, they're, they're old not, now, too. But, yeah. but, but I, I actually didn't even, I actually didn't even react to that. What I said was, okay. I said, you're, you're absolutely right. But what really worries me, bro, is that you, where you see a reason not to go, mm -hmm. I see a reason to run, run 180 That's miles per hour yeah. towards it. You know, and, and let me explain to you. I've had people come up to me here in Malaysia and yeah. Singapore and this region and yeah. tell me, AJ, uh, but there are not too many people on LinkedIn, bro, compared to Facebook and Instagram. Uh -huh. And I said, and your point is, and he goes, well, because, you know, there's not so many people. And I'm like, listen, How let me you? tell you something, bro. Are you telling me that as a photographer, this guy who talked to me was a photographer. Mm -hmm. Are you telling me that as a photographer, you'd rather go onto a platform that is saturated for your own competition. You'd rather go and try to become an iconic photographer on a platform like Instagram that already has probably with all due respect, a bazillion people who are better than you than mm -hmm. what you do, right? then shift your strategy towards a platform that doesn't have too many people figuring out the fact that there are not too many photographers on it there. Yeah. And you stand out quicker and faster and become a photographic icon on that platform yeah. so that you can turn that into revenue quicker because when CEOs are looking for a photographer, you're the guy who stands out because they see your content on their feed. You see? That's right. And then he goes blowing. He goes, his eyes go like, ooh, ooh. okay. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I didn't see it that way. And I said, exactly. So this is the meaning of half glass, half full, mm -hmm. half empty, half full sort of a thing, right? Yeah. That's how it is. Because right. you are constantly looking at something as a reason not to go. And I am looking at every obstacle in my life as a reason to run towards it, and face mm -hmm. it. And so therefore, your mindset is what dictates it. I told that to the students, yeah. every single friggin' one of them joined LinkedIn, bro, straight away and started tagging nice. me on the post and started building it. And nice. sure enough, two of those guys ended up working for multinationals in their first job, right? They got a job at a multinational yeah. simply because you they started reach. using LinkedIn to storytell, to, to share who they really are, yeah. right? People think LinkedIn is a job board. It isn't a job it board, man. Not, no. It's an opportunity for you to show people how you stand out in an ocean just like noise out yeah. there. So yeah, man, I hope I haven't taken up too much of your time, bro. I'm sorry. No, dude, that's, this is perfect. I didn't have anything. Um, I mean, I'm glad that we, we had the time that we have the time. I mean, I don't have any, any other interview after this for another couple hours, but I do have sure. a few questions for you to ask you that I ask, I ask all my guests. Sure. First off, what is one hobby that you wish you got into? Um, I really wish I got into fencing, bro. Um, wow, I haven't, so, never, I haven't heard that before. <laughs> yeah, I really wish I got into fencing because I think fencing is this beautiful art where mm -hmm. you, your footwork and your mental strategy, your mental frame of mind when you're up against your opponent, your opponent, and you're like, you've got, I can't remember the name, they have a name for it. The, mm -hmm. the, 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 it's, it looks like a sword, but it's actually not called a sword. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a saber. I think it's called a saber. It's a saber, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. You've got the saber and, you know, and there's a particular, I don't know if you've watched fencing matches, I've but there's a some. particular mm -hmm. stance you stand with and, mm -hmm. and, and there's a, a whole decorum. There's a whole technique behind it. There's footwork involved. Mm -hmm. It's not as easy as it looks. Um, yeah. It's very delicate. It's actually very, and um, I wish, I wish I took the time to truly invest myself when I was mm -hmm. younger. Um, even as early as five years ago, I wish I had done it. And I didn't, and uh, I, I kind of look back at it and I think, mm -hmm. wow, I wish I could find the time to go and do it now. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I know that's an excuse because I don't think there's anything in life that you, you can't do. Yeah. And uh, there's no such thing as there's not enough time. You just make that time. Yeah, uh, yeah. The reality is I've just been too lazy to pursue mm -hmm. it, right? Uh, I really need to get into it and uh, probably hoping that one day <laughs> I do find a way to get into it, right? Nice. So, I love it. Yeah, Zorro is all about fencing, man. I know that guy's dope. <laughs> this guy's dope. Oh, yeah, he's so so, and he always gets the, the you know the pretty girls. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh man. Oh man. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. Of course, it 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 doesn't like really help the fact that he's based in Spain, where all almost all the women are super attractive. So. That's true. There's oh, they're all super attractive. Every woman, every every damsel he saves happens to be very attractive. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, yeah. All right. Next one. What is your favorite movie or TV show? Uh, the Peaceful Warrior. Uh, it's based off the book with the same name. Okay. Uh, written by Dan Millman. Okay. And that's a book that I really recommend everyone read. Uh, the Peaceful Warrior uh, was something that actually changed my life. I watched that movie uh, about ten, close to about close to ten years ago. I think it was about eight nine years ago. Wow. And it really changed my life uh, because it really made me understand that everything that I had felt up till that moment. Mm. With my thoughts and my inner voice and my emotional intelligence and all these thoughts for the longest time, bro, you got to understand it. For the longest time I was kind of shot down by a lot of people, including mm. people who were close to me. Yeah. Even when I got older, even when I came, I became more articulate, even because even when I overcame everything bullying wise, you know, generally in my life, I noticed that a lot of my thoughts were shot down by people because, um, they thought I was idealistic. They thought mm. I was I was living in a different world, mm. and so that that did have a psychological impact on me for a long time. I was unsure if if this is all in my head, you know. Like I was unsure that okay, you know, maybe maybe all this stuff, maybe they're right. Maybe 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 they're right about me. Maybe I'm just a uh, you know an overzealous kid mm. who thinks he's gonna do something in the world, and you know he just he just full of shit, really. You know what I mean? Wow. Maybe I'm just walking down the path everybody else is. You know, they think they're going to do something, but they're not, right? Yeah. And until I saw The Peaceful Warrior, and it just clicked. It just clicked in my mind because you need to see the movie for me, for, for you to understand, bro. But yeah. if you do, if you do watch the movie, you'll understand the, the, the concept of self-awareness, the concept of, of life skills, the concept of emotional intelligence, the concept of, of giving attention to the skills that go beyond textbooks that people had been shooting me down for. Yeah. For, all my all my life before that and 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 you know making me feel bad that i never got into an ivy league university making mm -hmm. me feel bad that i never got i never was a valedictorian making That's me feel insane. bad that i did you know all that stuff all of a sudden that very moment when i watched the peaceful warrior i had that clarity to realize that i'm i'm right and they were wrong mm -hmm. that, 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 that's that's what happened nice. and that's why it's an important movie for me because it, it was that tipping point where I think I unlocked the true base that, that, that I am today now. Mm -hmm. That was the beginning of my base. Yeah. Right? The beginning of, of, of who I would become in the future. This was about nine, eight, nine, nine eight years ago, right? So nice. it was a long time ago. And I, I'm so thankful to Dan Millman for writing the books. And then there was obviously the, the, the movie's a little bit glamorized, a bit more, right, it's a bit right. more glamorized, mm -hmm. but the essence of the book is still very much so in the movie. Nice. And I really connect with the the main protagonist, the, the main, the main, the main hero of the film, the character. Who's, who's a kid who's preparing uh, for the Olympics. And uh, he meets this random guy at the petrol station uh, that he nicknames Socrates, right? Mm -hmm. And he spends more and more time with this guy who just fuels up people's cars as they come by. And they, the, the whole movie unravels in such a magical way where you see this top scoring, straight A, super fit, Olympic, you know, really nearly to the Olympic sort of a kid who's mm -hmm. got everything going in his life, learning the true meaning of life from a guy who fills petrol up mm -hmm. at a petrol station, right? And it's really, really humbling. It's really, really amazing to see how the peaceful warrior is based on a true story. And when wow. I, when I knew that I was like, shit, man, this is true. This is a true story. I need to. And, and then I read, I picked up the book after watching the movie. And when I read the books, I was like, damn, everything that I go through in my own life and everything that I deem a superpower in terms of mindfulness, in terms of being 100% focused in this very moment. Mm -hmm. And then you could do things, you can perform better than other people because you're so focused in that moment. Yeah. yeah. You know, everything that I, all of a sudden became it got validated by dan millman and his material so i would recommend anybody if, if they really want to find a little a, a part of themselves really you should check out the peaceful warrior oh 
definitely put it on the on the queue. Um, I'm always looking for new movie choices, man. This is a good one. Um, next question is, what movie would you choose if you got to play a character in it? Huh. That's a tough one. Damn. Uh... And just to give you a little context on why I picked this question or shaped it this way is the book Ready Player One. Yeah, yeah. Right. So yeah. in it, you have to, he has to know all the lines that Matthew Broderick says in war games. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. And they did, they did it a little differently in the movie. But oh, if we were, if we had that opportunity, you know, where would we go? Wow. There's so many choices that are running through my mind right now. I don't <laughs> know what to pick. Uh, uh, Okay, this is gonna sound really, really messed up, uh, but like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is gonna really sound messed up. So it's like, I'm, so it's a like close. So I'm gonna go. I'm, I'm gonna go on the on the non-productive side of AJ mm-hmm. here. Right? I'm gonna I'm gonna step away from the coach AJ, the mm-hmm. speaker AJ, the storyteller AJ. I'm just gonna go to the kid AJ now, right? Yeah. And I'm gonna tell you, I'll, I'll, you're not gonna laugh at me, okay? No, I, I swear to God, if you laugh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, I laugh with you. If if I could embody any character, mm-hmm. I think I would be Optimus Prime. Oh. I don't know. I don't know why. I just think I would. I, I think it's it's very close to who I am as a person in real mm-hmm. life. Like I I I I don't know. I don't explain it to you, man. I just I feel like No, I, I totally feel it, man. I totally feel it based on your the conversation that we've had so far and it, you know and anytime i hear um optimus prime's voice and it's what's beautiful is that it's the same actor doing the voice yeah. since peter the cullen. Age, right peter cullen and the the level of depth <laughs> he has in his voice and when you hear those words right it's like they they, they touch your soul is just touch your soul and, and, and uh, i th- i think I don't know. I, I think he had a pronounced impact on me when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I, I don't know how old you are, Janet, but like, you know, as I'm in my forties. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm in my early thirties. Right. Mm-hmm. And I grew up in, I grew up at this time where, you know, we didn't have fancy graphics on TV, mm-hmm. but we did have transformers back in the day. And yeah. I used to watch transformers when it was those tacky blocks with poor mm-hmm. animation. But you know what the beauty was, bro? Beauty was, irrespective of how shitty that animation was, there was always a lesson and a value in each of those episodes. Uh, with Absolutely. all due respect, cartoons have gone downhill now. You yes, watch cartoons have. now, Just... they're crap, most of them, right? Um, Unfortunately, yeah. And I see, I, see, I see that in my own childhood. I see Thundercats. I see He-Man. I see, I see the Jetsons. I see the Flintstones. I see Transformers, mm-hmm. and I gotta tell you, all of these these shows, they always had an underlying value in each yes. of those episodes for you to yeah. learn something. I miss that. I miss I miss the fact that we've lost that human connection in trying mm-hmm. to show people something to make themselves feel better and to do better in their own lives. Because when you yeah. see cartoons today, it's purely for the entertainment value. It is, it's yeah. Purely for the commercial ratings. It's not for truly driving home something but optimus was different for me bro optimus just not the voices the voice is absolutely spot on bro the voices peter cullen's voice is, is iconic yeah. but there's something else about optimus that optimus was was the was the embodiment of being able to do the right thing in the hardest times right yes. um he was outgunned outnumbered uh the decepticons could fly Mm-hmm. Uh, the Decepticons had massive tech all the time. Megatron had a much bigger army, right? Mm-hmm. The uh, the Autobots were just a group of a group of robots that were yeah. always fighting the odds and always on the losing side of those odds. Yeah, they're and the underdogs. They're the literal underdogs. The underdogs, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Ironhide, Optimus Prime. You know, um, all these guys. They were they were like these underdogs. But the the really the, the, the thing the thing that I think just stayed with me, bro, was the fact that they never gave up. They didn't. He never stopped. Optimus never, never changed his policies. 
never changed his principles. He stayed mm -hmm. off of his prime, yeah. even though the times were hard, even though people turned against him, even though Megatron had, in every which way, a much stronger army at his disposal. He always Optimus, had the upper hand. Exactly. And yeah. Optimus continued being Optimus despite that. And he protected people. He, 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 you know, I mean, I remember there was a t shirt. I had a kid as a kid, and I used to love wearing it to the park when I used to play football. And the front of it, it would say, you know, Decepticons destroy, right? But at the back, it would say Autobots protect, right? And I remember that, right? Because mm -hmm. as a kid, I used to, I used to admire that in Optimus. Yeah. That despite the fact of always being able to take the easy way out, Optimus is such a powerful robot. Yeah. He was stronger than all the Autobots combined because he. He was a he was a leader of the Autobots. You know, mm -hmm. he was a really strong character, but he chose to use that strength, and he used, chose to temper that strength for something that wasn't evil, but for something that was good. Right? He was protecting others. So that's why you picked to be a Jedi, a, right? Yeah, a Jedi, right? So if if I could be a character, bro, as shitty yeah. as it sounds, as childish as it sounds, dude, it sounds awesome. Time, bro. It sounds really awesome. I love it. Thanks, man. So, two more quick questions. Who is right. your favorite superhero? Oh, Batman, bro. Batman. Batman. It's got to be Batman. Batman. The Dark Knight. Awesome. The Dark Knight is the embodiment of a man of sheer will. Um, it's, it and, is. Uh, it, it's all yeah, I mean, will. It's nothing else. Nothing else. He doesn't have, he's not, he's not from another planet. He wasn't bitten by a radioactive spider. Yeah. He doesn't have a ring. He, he's just, He's just a guy. Yeah. He's just a guy who he's has just a guy in the cave. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's trained his body and mind to a point where he has reached close to superhuman abilities. Yeah. Not through not through by ha being handed handed over to him by some cosmic cosmic energy. Yeah. But because he chose to be that man. He chose. He chose to have the will to act, right? Yeah. And that was always something that really inspired me in Batman. Batman always inspired me because I could never really connect with all the other superheroes because mm -hmm. they weren't real enough for me. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, quite frankly, as a kid growing up, even as a kid, you know, you know that you're never going to be bitten by a radioactive spider to become Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not from another planet. You know, you're yeah. from Earth. Um, you know, you, you know, yeah. you know, you're not going to get a ring that turns your will into objects like Green Lantern. Yeah. You know what I mean? Green Lantern, like, yeah. All this is crap. You know, it's all fictional. But Batman, Batman was different. Batman, you could you could argue mm -hmm. that someone could truly become Batman if they wanted yeah. to. If someone really wanted to become the Cape Crusader, they could actually become the Dark Knight exactly. with enough training, with enough money, with enough intention. They could actually fight crime and truly mm -hmm. become Batman in real yeah. life. Right? Yeah. And there was a book written about this by I can't remember his name. Mm -hmm. It's from Harvard, a professor. A kinesiologist, right, who specialized in martial arts and kinesiology, uh -huh. and uh, he wrote a book called "How to Become Batman." Oh, it was nice. the most thrilling book that I've ever read because <laughs> it was a real life account of how someone in the real world would become Batman. Wow. And the outcome of the book was very interesting. The outcome of the book was someone can indeed become Batman in this world. Someone can truly become Batman. They can actually become the Batman that you see in the comics. But mm -hmm. the only difference is that he or she would be only able to stay Batman for a matter of one to three years. That's it. They would not be able to sustain the damage they incur night no. on night fighting crime. No. Right? As, a human, as a human being in the real world, outside of the comics, that's one thing that's a bit fictional about Batman. It's because Batman gets... He's jumping off rooftops every night and he's <laughs> fighting crime and doing all this stuff. He's being beaten, bruised every night. The reality is Batman could not have existed as that one man for 20 years the way yeah. he did in the comics, right? Yeah, it's impossible. He, he would have to pass the mantle on to someone else. Mm -hmm. But therein lies a huge challenge because the sheer amount of will, training, uh, business acumen, and all of that required to become Batman in the first place Yeah. Finding one person with that will is already going to be tough enough. Forget about having someone else would be, would be ready to take on the mantle of Batman. Mm -hmm. right? So therein lies the issue. But yeah. to answer your question, bro, the Dark Knight. <laughs> Love it.
If you were a board game, what would it be? If it was a board game, now, uh, I think I'd be Cluedo. <laughs> awesome. I'd be Cluedo That's because nice. because I like I like uh, the mystery. Wait, mm -hmm. Cluedo is the one. Wait, it's Clue. Cluedo is the one where where this murder, right? Yes, yeah, the murder. The one that they've yeah. got Mr. Peacock and all that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah so you got a rope, you got the weapon cards, and you got the the people who 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 did it, right? Who's the yeah. murderer? Yep. Who's yeah, murderer? that's Cluedo. Then that's me. Nice. I totally be Cluedo, man. <laughs> like, I think I think that's just the embodiment of of the sort of life I like to lead. It has to be a bit mysterious. Yeah. It has to be some predictability in it, <laughs> and I gotta like I got all sorts of stuff happening around me. That's Half the awesome. time I don't know who did it. Yeah. But it's fun finding out who did it, right? So <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much it. Love it. Well, thank you so much for your time. You know, when you mentioned, you know, we, we need to have a better um, resources for our children from nine to 16. And I think one of the, one of the greatest organizations that's been around since 1920s is the Boy Scouts of America or yeah. Boy Scouts all around the world. I mean, they teach you life lessons that you wouldn't anywhere, you know, you wouldn't have any way to learn yeah. those anywhere else. I completely so agree. It's it's a very powerful and then they have these Eagle Scout ceremonies where, you know, where, you know, when you're eighteen, just about to finish college and now you can be an Eagle Scout because it just doesn't mean that you stop there. Yeah. You keep on going, but it builds that character in you as a person that knows who knows who you are and knows what limitations you have. Yeah, absolutely. And I completely agree. Yeah. The Boy Scouts and um there is another organization for the girls. Uh, Girl Scouts. Mm -hmm. Girl Scouts. And there's also something else. Where I think it's it's a Girl Scout. I think it's Girl Scouts. It's Girl right? Scouts. But but Boy Scouts are now also uh, accepting girls now. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. so they, that happened, I think, last year. So it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty dope, man. And uh, I've, I've been a huge fan of anything that, that puts kids through something that's character building. Uh, yeah. As yeah. It's just being fully focused on academics. Yeah. So I'm sure the Boy Scouts have done that too since the 1920s. It's amazing, bro. Mm -hmm. um, and what what's really cool is um, I've had my son in it for the past, you know, since kindergarten. So the, for, for the past five years, he's been, you know, we're doing these Cub Scouts. And I was uh, I was at this meeting the other day. Uh, it was for all adult Scout leaders and whatnot. And I was like, you know, that's really interesting. Is my son's been in there for five years. My younger son, who's just who's going to be turning five, he's going to be a Cub Scout starting next year. So that's another five years. And then my daughter, who's just turning two, when she becomes five, she's going to be a Cub Scout. So yeah. I've got another 10 years of being oh, a leader. Cub Scouting, brother. <laughs> I'm like, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. That is amazing. That's quite a journey, bro. Amazing. It is quite a journey. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, a, thank you. And thank I, you. I'm sure it's going to add a wealth of, 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 of knowledge and and character to your kids, right? Yeah, that's yeah. amazing, man. Well done. So, um, I'm pretty excited. I, I about hope. That. I hope. I hope. I'm sorry for the if, if the recording went on too long. I'm no, dude, this is perfectly fine. We've got so much value out of this. It's it's full of lessons, full of you know what we should be doing and and what the future needs to hold. And then you know, there's so many great points, and and I love doing these longer ones because. You know, we really go in the depth of the things. You know, we're not on the surface anymore. I mean, I mean, I don't know how you're gonna slice and dice this. Do you typically like slice and dice things? Not a whole lot. It's just as is, man. Okay. Mostly as okay. is, um, because that's when you get the real good value out of it. You know, you get to listen. But I mean, if I have time, which I'll probably hire somebody to go find the really good nuggets and you know put that put put those out separately. But again, I my my marketing game is very very weak right now. Right, right, right. But I'm working on it. No, but yeah, man. Where where can my audience find you? Uh, find me on LinkedIn. All right. Find LinkedIn. LinkedIn. I apologize, guys. I'm a little bit under the weather. I've got a bit of a fever right now. I've got a bit of a flu. Oh my um, god. I'm, I've been coughing since you, the morning. You need to uh, sleep. So I've been sounding a bit. I'm sorry if I've been sounding a bit nasal. You sound uh, really uh, good. But but like yeah. My apologies, man. Right. So uh, it was. It has been an immense pleasure, Jeanette. 
Absolutely. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I've got to tell you guys, Janet reached out to me a while ago. Um, I messed up with our timings the first time out. <laughs> uh, but you know what? I think everything happens for a reason. Um, I love Janet's work. I love what he's doing. Um, Thank you, man. He's Thank also a much. storyteller. So I love connecting with other storytellers. And, uh, you know, these two storytellers got together and really kicked it today. Um, right. And I really hope the audience thinks we crushed it. Um, but, you know, that's, we can only wait to see how that, how they react, right? Yeah. yeah uh, exactly. And how, if anybody gained any value out of this. So that's thank right. you again, Janet. And, thank you uh, so much. Hope everybody has an awesome, it's, it's, it's 1230 in the night here. So good night. <laughs> and in the U.S., I suppose it's, it's, it's almost noon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's almost, oh, it's okay. It's nearly the PM now. So yeah. yeah. Have a good day, guys. Have so. a good one. Uh, Steve Chait, good night. All right, man. Congratulations, you made it to the end of the episode. Thanks so much for listening to our guest on this episode. Please send me an email at junaid at hexandhobbies.com to tell me what you loved about our guest today. You could find links mentioned in this episode on the hacksandhobbies.com website.